If you've been dreaming of changing the world, but you're not sure where to start, the Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast will help you transform your life and create a thriving business that aligns with your values and goals. This podcast is for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life they desire. You deserve it, and it is possible. It's time for you to add value. Today's guests, Mac and Rhea Story. Mac's story has logged over 11,000 hours leading teams through organizational change. He is the author of the extremely popular Blue Collar Leadership Series. Rhea Story is an author, TEDx speaker, and expert in leadership and life skills for women. Rhea has nearly 20 years of experience in leadership and management. Mac and Rhea co-founded Top Story Leadership in 2008, are certified leadership speakers and trainers, and have published 32 books on leadership development and personal growth. Noelle and I have an inspiring conversation with Mac and Rhea's story about giving up corporate success to have the freedom of entrepreneurship. We talk about choosing to thrive and not just survive your past. The biggest impact is their motivation, not trying to make a lot of dollars. They are seeking to make a lot of difference. Well, Rhea and Mac, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just so excited to have this conversation and to learn from you guys. We're excited too. Uh, just such a privilege to uh, have a conversation with you guys. We're looking forward to it. Absolutely. Nice. So obviously both of you now are, are pretty deep into your entrepreneurial journey, but um, how did you decide to, to become entrepreneurs and get started? Well, I guess it started with me back in, in 2008. I had been working in manufacturing for 20 years at that time. And, and, uh, my boss was trying to get me to do something I didn't really want to do. So I decided I was going to keep doing what I actually wanted to do. It was, it was pretty much the first time in my career that I didn't do whatever the boss wanted to do. I had been, I had been growing and climbing the ladder and doing basically, I could always figure out how to do whatever they wanted me to do, but I had found a, a passion for process improvement and leading teams. And that's what I wanted to do. And so in 2008, in the middle of the great recession, I showed everybody, everyone how smart I was and I quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, started my own lean manufacturing consulting business. Took me a little while to get going, but but it, it did uh, maybe about nine months before I actually got my first client. But then I was booked solid all the way up until 2012. And 2008 is happens to be also when I first started uh, reading leadership development and personal growth books. First first time that I had ever even been exposed to it was 2008, and been reading every day since then. But but all of that growth from reading every day during those four years kind of led me to my passion for leadership development. So in at the end of 2012, I decided I don't want to do lean manufacturing process improvement anymore. I want to go into the leadership development and personal growth space. And, and so I gave up that income, which was about four times my income that I gave up in 2008. So, so that, that was a bit more of a challenge. And then a year later, Rhea was, was so jealous of me being broke, she decided to give up her job and be broke with me. <laughs> there are two sides to every story. <laughs> and then there's the truth somewhere in the middle, right? That's kind of how I jumped off. I mean, I jumped off cold turkey and gave up everything. And and then when Rhea joined me, we really gave up everything. And and I'll let you jump in there with how you know how you got to that point. Um, yeah, so my journey was a little bit different. Um, I was um, a victim of sexual abuse by my father. And as you know, starting from age 12, as I got older, the abuse progressed. And, and as I got older, he got bolder. And by the time I was 17, he was um, regularly having sex with me and would, would bargain with me uh, for things like a night out with my friends in exchange for sexual favors. And it progressed to the point of trafficking me to men he would meet off of the internet. And there were times when life was not worth living um, back then. And, and I thought about it. I thought about a tub of warm water and, and a razor blade. Um, but at 19, I met a knight in a shiny Camaro. I don't know about the night part. I did have a cool supercharged Z28 at the time though. 20 <laughs> years later, we've long since gotten rid of the car, but I, I kept him. And, uh, you know, I didn't have anything when I left home. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a high school diploma. I'd never been to school. I was homeschooled uh, my whole life. And that was 2000 when we met. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, after I left home, I didn't want to talk about what happened to me. I didn't want people to know that about me. I was afraid people would see me as a victim. 
Um, and just carrying a lot of shame and, you know, hurt from that experience and trauma. And so when I left, I was like, I'm going to lock that past up behind the closet door and <laughs> throw away the key, right? I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. I'm just moving on with my life. And I knew I couldn't have articulated it back then, but I knew I could spend the rest of my life using what happened to me as an excuse for why I couldn't go do, be, and have what I wanted in life, right? We, we, my story is unfortunately not that un uncommon, but it's not everyone's story, but everyone goes through adversity in life. And, you know, we can take what life gives us and be bitter about it or better because of it. And I wouldn't have said it in so many words back then, but I was just determined to leave it behind. And uh, so I didn't really talk about it. But beyond a few close family members and friends, I didn't talk about uh, my story. And then, uh, you know, started working at Pizza Hut because it was the only job that I that I could find. And I, I speak for a lot of high school groups and youth groups today. And I love to ask those the youth, like, how much money do you think I was making back then before most of them were born? Right. And they're like, oh, ten dollars an hour, fifteen dollars. an hour. I'm like, no, two dollars and 13 cents an hour plus some tips. Right. To pick up. And, half, I, and I was proud of her <laughs> <laughs> to pick up half eaten pizza crust off the floor and bust dirty tables. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. We all start somewhere. That's where I started. And then you all to realize that's not what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And the job of my dreams wasn't going to come find me at Pizza Hut. And uh, so I had to start taking some classes and community co college courses and progressed to another job and another promotion and worked my way up. And in 2013, I considered myself to be successful, certainly from where I'd come from. And um, I had a good job, a great organization, great leaders. But I, uh, we went, Mac and I went down to a conference in Orlando, Florida, and we heard Les Brown speak for the first time. And I mean, he's speaking to this whole room full of people, right? And he says to this whole room full of people, you have a story to share and someone wants to hear your story and you can help that person. And I thought, I've got a story to share, but I don't want to share it, right? I worked really hard to put that behind me. Um, and it took me six months after hearing that to really get to the point of, you know, should I share my story? Could I share my story? I wasn't sure that I could. Um, we went back for a speaker training and Max signed us up for six months later. And part of the speaker training was... Uh, everyone was going to be asked to write a 60 and deliver a 60 second speech because Les Brown says the best speakers make the fewest words go the farthest. So you could say whatever you wanted, but you could only talk for 60 seconds. And I'd been thinking about this and praying about this. And I didn't even tell anyone, not even Mac, that I was considering sharing my story because I wasn't sure that I could go through with things. But I was secretly over there hoping she was listening to Mr. Les Brown and she was going to share her story with the world, but I had no idea. She hadn't told me she had even thought about that whatsoever. So the morning of the speaker um, training and the contest came and, and it was a contest. The five winners were going to be chosen and invited to share the stage with Les Brown. And the morning of the speaker training contest came and I had a meltdown in the ladies room. I mean like ugly <laughs> mascara running, crying meltdown. And you know, I, to me, that was really the, the defining moment in saying I'm either going to honor this or or not, right? I'm either going to let it own me or I'm going to own it. And so I fixed the mascara and went back in and it ended up being a 47 second speech. And it didn't matter when I got done if I won the contest because I won such a greater victory inside me. She over delivered. <laughs> Instead of 60 seconds, she got it done in 47. <laughs> But I did win. Um, as it turns out, I was one of the five winners chosen, invited to speak in uh, L.A. with Les Brown a couple months later. Ten days after that, I resigned from that job I'd gone to college for 10 years to get because I discovered the difference between a career and a calling. Nice. So what helped you find freedom? Um, for me, it really was the realization that whatever happens to us in life, we can be a victim. Um, I think that's the biggest form of limiting belief is that what happens to us determines us, right? And there's no doubt that what happens to us in life influences us, but it doesn't define us. It doesn't determine us. We don't have to make bad choices in life because of things that happen to us. Stephen Covey calls it being proactive, right? And choosing my response. See, the thing is we're 
we're human and we have emotions because we're emotional creatures. We like to think that we're rational and logical, but, but we're not. <laughs> we're emotional. And when bad things happen, there's pain or hurt or anger or whatever. There's an emotion there. But as Andy Stanley, who reminds us, our feelings are terrible leaders, right? Those emotions are there, but we don't have to choose a response based on them. And when we can master that, it's not easy. It's much easier said than done, right? But it does get easier the more you practice it. And I know I'm not the only one who said or done something in the moment and gone, mm, I shouldn't have said that or done that, right? We do have these emotions and we, we can be reactive and respond to them, but that doesn't serve us in the long run. And it was that realization that there again, I can own, you know, my story and sharing it takes a, a terrible thing and, and uses it in a positive way. And that realization, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a victim because see the moment we start blaming somebody or something else for why we can't do be and have what we want in life is the moment we lose our freedom to go after it. Right. As long as I'm blaming someone else for something that I have or don't have, I'm blaming someone else for my circumstances. I give up my freedom to, to change it, to influence it affect it we don't control what happens we always control our response to what happens that is that's emotional freedom absolutely that that level of self-leadership is is pretty valuable and now you both are using that discipline to help others develop their leadership skills and and building your business can you talk a little bit about each of your your niche um, audience who you serve and and what you what you offer them? Yeah, for, for me, I, I focus on the blue collar leadership space, although Rhea and I both speak to all types of, of groups. I mean, we, we were invited to speak at Yale University in 2018 on blue collar leadership. And I, I never saw that one coming. That's why that's why you just you just get out there and start growing and let the rest of it take care of itself. I mean, I, I never had a dream of speaking at Yale. I, I really, really it ain't a big deal that I, I spoke at Yale, not for me. It's a big deal in, in general because Yale is a big deal, but I'd, I'd rather be speaking to the you know the frontline blue collar entry level workforce, and that's that's who I speak to a lot. But we also speak to high level leaders, business owners, CEOs, and those kind of groups. Uh, just a moment ago, before I got on here with you, just got a call from some man who found me on on internet today on on the uh, doing a search, and he's actually up in New York, and he's over. A, the maintenance crews and uh, over 11 different schools up in, in Northern New York, I think is where he was from. And he, he had been there two years as a leader and he was talking about no one had ever given his team, the, you know, the people doing the work and the leaders of those doing the work. He's, he's like a VP level or something like that. And, but he was saying no one had ever developed the folks. They don't, they don't even know what formal leadership development is. And, and that's what I found out in 2008, I had worked in, Basically, for 20 years, I had worked in multi-billion dollar global organizations. And first 10 years, I was a frontline entry-level factory worker. And then I started moving my way up. And and by the time I resigned, I reported to the plant manager. And I was responsible for process improvement of our entire facility of about 200 people. And the thing is, though, during those 20 years, no leader ever invested one penny or one minute introducing me to this type of development. And when I discovered it in 2008, and I started reading every day and it didn't take me long to figure out that white collar executives are taught this stuff all the time. You know, companies spend tens of thousands of dollars at once to send them to a, a one or two day conference. And once I figured all that out, I said, I'm, I'm going to be the person that's going to bring this back to what I call my people, the, the regular, <laughs> the regular people, the people who are too often overlooked, underappreciated, underdeveloped. And I'm telling you, it's so amazing to go out and pour into these people. We were up in uh, Pennsylvania last week and mm -hmm. at a roofing company, and they had never heard anything like we were there to talk about. But at the end, nearly 100 people were up in line shaking our hands, getting getting books. The company had bought our books to hand out to the people, and the people are just so appreciative. It's it's just pretty powerful. So that's that's really my lane is anybody in any industry in the in the blue collar space. Uh, mine's a little different than Max. Um, you know most women in general tend to, to have the frustration of realizing that they don't have as much influence as they want, either personally or professionally, right? 
they feel like they are a victim of circumstances or that they cannot influence people in the way that they want. And so I really like to focus on personal and professional leadership for women that help them increase influence and develop leadership and maximize their results. Because I really think it comes down to leading myself first so that I can influence others at a higher level. That's so good. <clears throat> so what's one of the biggest challenges of working together and, and how did you push through it? <laughs> well, you you probably understand, you know, we live and work and travel together. Wait, you gotta you gotta know that everybody's gotta know no matter what she says about me, I'm gonna love her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we spend an, uh, an enormous amount of time together, right? We were together seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And when you spend that much time with somebody and you live, work and travel with them, you have to go way beyond just loving them. You actually have to like them. Well, there's a big difference. A lot of people don't know that difference, but there's a big difference between liking somebody and loving somebody. I think really that the biggest, uh, challenge and Mac may have a different perspective on this, but probably the biggest challenge was realizing that when we are in our, you know, we speak together most of the time, the principles that we teach are the same regardless of the audience, but realizing that when we were speaking more in a blue collar space that I would, you know, obviously speak a little bit less and Mac would teach a little bit more versus a, a group of women, then I take a little more of a role in, in the teaching and speaking. And the probably the main challenge is that we're both so completely passionate about it. We both want to talk 100% of the time, and that doesn't work. So we have to learn to toss the ball back and forth. Um, but I think we've managed that. Yeah, I'd say that's the that's the really is the biggest challenge when we both. I mean, we speak together most often. Even if we're speaking to a blue collar group, Rio usually joins me, and because we male, female, husband, wife. What, blue collar, white collar, so it's very dynamic, you know, for the audience, and she makes fun of me a lot and that sort of thing. But uh, that is the biggest challenge because no matter which one of us is talking, we both got some what we both believe to be really some good stuff to give the audience. So when she's talking, I love listening to her talk, and and uh, but it, when she, you know, if we go together, whenever we get done, I'll, I'll always be like, man, I, I wish I could talk more. <laughs> But if I go speak for an hour or two hours or four hours or eight hours, more. I still come home and say, man, I wish I could talk more. So it really doesn't matter if, if she's there or not. I, 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 don't, I don't get to talk enough. <laughs> nice. Thanks, uh, so tell, tell us a little how valuable connection is for you guys. You mean connection to the audience, to the two we're talking to? Well, it, connection, either building a, your network and, or your audience. I mean, obviously, there's lots of levels, right? Your connection is is one level for the two of you. And then, of course, you know, connection towards not just the audience you're speaking to, but even uh, finding new audiences, right? Finding new opportunities. And so mm -hmm. lots of different ways that, that you could share about connection. Yeah. You know, to me, I think connection is critical because it leverages and multiplies communication. Um, rather, whether we're trying to, you know, communicate with a significant other or a spouse or communicate to an audience, if we're not connecting at an emotional level, people aren't interested in what we have to say, right? The connection is what makes the message received and, and you know, much more valuable. Uh, I think it's um, John Maxwell who said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And Maya Angela reminds us, people will not always remember what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And I think that's the critical piece of com connection that a lot of presenters or teachers miss is they feel a need to get up and deliver information without realizing that if you're not connecting to the audience, that information is just going over somebody's head. We probably all had the experience of a teacher, whether a high school or, or college or something like that, who just got up and had a boring set of slides and you're zoning out and you're thinking about 8,000 other things because there's no connection there and nobody's listening um, consciously or subconsciously. Yeah, I, I would say this, you know, a lot for us, a lot of uh, people who bring us in when we're doing like on-site development, on-site training, especially for the blue collar groups, a lot of times they've never done anything, had anybody in like us to talk and they're expecting the point, point, point and all that sort of stuff. And we come in and we just start talking to the people, you know, telling stories and trying to get them to loosen up, and laugh and realize we're just regular people and we just want to help you have a better life. And I mean, that's that's the stories we tell them. But for me personally, 
I actually read John's book, John Maxwell at Rio was talking about everyone communicates, you connect. And at that time I was still doing lean manufacturing process improvement. I was leading teams and actually I was doing at that specific time, I was doing a, a one week course where I'd take about 20 people through a, a classroom type training, about 75% leadership and about 25% process improvement, lean manufacturing principles being taught. And I had been, I, I basically took about 1200 people through that. Uh, took quite a while because I was 20 people out of time. So it was a week after week after week after week doing that. And so I had been doing it a while and it would always take till about somewhere between Tuesday, midday, Tuesday and midday, Wednesday for the people really to, to be connected. I didn't even know to use the word then, but today I know that's what was happening. It took, it took a day and a half to two and a half days before they would feel connected. But after I read that one book from John, and started applying what I was learning in that book. I mean, it took like 15 minutes on Monday morning and I was connected because I started making it about the people. And I started remembering, I, I would get the uh, the person in, in the plant that I was working in to put everybody's name down, to, to assign seats to everybody and give me a, a, a key with everybody's name. And I would learn their name. So when I come in, I would introduce them all to each other. And they were like, how does this guy know who we are? They don't even know each other a lot of times. <laughs> but it allowed me to really connect and, and start moving a, a lot faster. Nice. nice. So how did you develop confidence individually and as a couple? Um, I think confidence, we, to understand confidence, we really have to understand that um, 87 to 90% of our results in life, our influence with other people is based on our character. While only 10 to 13% of that is based on our competency, right? It's not what we know. It's how we do what we do. That's determining our success. It's determining our influence with other people. It's determining, you know, everything that we do. We don't always think about that. We think about competencies and skills. Competencies are skills and talents and, you know, the, the work that we do. And there's a lot of focus on getting those skills. And that's critical, right? We have to have those. But it's how we do what we do that's determining success. We don't, we don't really think about that. So it's think of that from a personal level, your medical doctor, I guarantee you, you want him or her to have graduated medical school, right? That's competency, but it's how he or she makes you feel in all of five minutes, once a year that you spend with them that determines if you want to go back or maybe it's not even the doctor's character. Maybe it's the nurse that walks you back or the receptionist that doesn't greet you when you walk up to the desk. So to, when we understand that, we realize that we can have situational confidence, which is based on our skills. And that's something we can develop, right? If I want to develop my skills as a, as a teacher or speaker, then I can develop that and, and work on that skill. That's situational, right? I can develop that skill and get really good at that, but I can't do heart surgery because that's a totally different situation. That's competency based. And so situational confidence is very dynamic. It's going to change based on the different influences of the situation. But true self-confidence, confidence in my character is pretty static. Now, obviously we can develop that over time, but you know, if we want to develop our self-confidence, our, our confidence in our character and who we are as a person, that takes a lot of time, reflection, personal growth thinking about our values, thinking about who we are as an individual and how does that translate? Because, you know, it's kind of like with leadership, who you are inside is what people are going to experience outside and, and you can't hide that. So I think for me, developing that self-confidence was really realizing I have to just grow, focus on my own personal growth because that's going to be the foundation uh, for character development. And, and I think maybe it was easier for me, uh, just, I don't know. I was in Marine Corps right out of high school. Like, that'll give you a lot of confidence. <laughs> and then I was in the infantry, but I really went into the Marine Corps just to prove that there was nothing to Paris Island. I, I had heard so much about it. My uncle was in the Marines and I actually graduated second in my platoon from Paris Island, got a meritorious promotion. So I, I felt like I was successful at that. And I was one of the littlest guys in the platoon. I think I weighed 128 pounds. <laughs> it was, and I was just a small guy, but I've always had, confidence but but you know it's relative to like Rhea said relative to your competency the character side of me I had confidence but if I didn't have the competency I, I would I'd be you know very anxious and that's not that's kind of the opposite of competent is being anxious with anxiety and that sort of thing so 
I just always tell people to spend about 80% of your time focusing on character development, about 20% of your time focusing on whatever competency that, that you're interested in. And for me, speaking and teaching about leadership was, was easy because like I just told you guys earlier, I, t- I took those people through, you know, one week. I would speak a week at a time, not an hour at a time. I had to speak for a week almost, you know, every week for, for years I did that. And so I was teaching them a, a core set of content, but I had set that up. So I had about tw- uh, about 50% of that week I could talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. What I talked about was all the books that I was reading. So every week, every week my week-long event was different. 50% of it was the same, but 50% was different. So I was able to hone in on my – my leadership skills because I was teaching it, I had to live it better. And, you know, that, that's a big point that we make when, when leaders actually start teaching their teams about leadership, they're going to become more confident as leaders because they're actually going to start leading. You can't, you can't walk around and tell everybody what you should be and what I should be on a daily basis without trying to, to get better. It just doesn't work like that because if you're the kind of person that's actually going to talk about it, you're probably going to try to apply it. If you're not going to talk about it, you're probably not going to try to apply it. So, Nice. for me you know I, to me the key is just to be authentic mm. i see a lot of people who want to get in this space and in this industry and they always want to be like somebody else and they're never going to be successful trying to be somebody else because they're never going to be somebody else and just like me the way that i talk i make a joke first thing i say when we get on stage and real me talk is i tell everybody i'm bilingual i speak english and country and sometimes at the same time <laughs> <laughs> well Simplify. I uh, I also served right out of high school, and uh, and and of course I'm a San Diego Marine, so we were issued sunglasses and lawn chairs. You know, <laughs> make sure we get a suntan. And uh, you know, I di- I didn't want to conquer Marine Corps boot camp. For me, it was it was if I'm going to join the military, I wanted to join the best and and be one of the best. And so that's why I joined the Marines. You know, with my couple buddies out of high school, and and similar to you, I had. I had a really good career. The Marine Corps was really, really good to me. And of course led to not only my love of continued love of leadership, but also my love of travel because I got to, to see, you know, nine different countries in the world because of the Marine Corps. And, and uh, so definitely appreciate that. Thank you for your service. And well, thank you, Robert. Let me say something right there, if you don't mind, because <laughs> for the folks listening, you know, I, and you'll understand better than a lot of people, but I had a, I had to do a lot of unlearning, as I started learning about leadership, I had to unlearn a whole, a whole lot of stuff that, that very effective if you're going to be in the Marine infantry and got to do what those folks do, but it ain't effective out here trying to connect with people. That, they don't teach you loving and hugging and connecting. And that, that's all. <laughs> you're loving and hugging at boot camp. That would be different. <laughs> you, so you both- because you're out in some 10 degree weather, it's cold and that's the only way you can get warm. <laughs> that, that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I like Rhea, you mentioned character as the definition of, of who you are on the inside. Um, and obviously I think character is a reflection of, I mean, character shows in your action, right? I mean, we can all say, you know, I do this or I do that. I show up on time, I'm responsible. Um, but the truth is your character is really gonna reflect in, in your actions, you know, in, in alignment with those words. And you both mentioned character as part of confidence, but but how important is um, developing your character and, and having, um, I don't want to say righteous, but that seems to be the word that's coming to mind, a, a right character. Uh, well, I think it's critical when we, you know, research does show that it's determines as much as 87 to 90% of success in life. And the thing about that is, I mean, I've got three, I've got three um, college degrees in management. Wow. But not one single class, not one single credit hour ever talked about how do I influence people effectively? How do you connect with, how people? Do you connect with people? How do you influence people to do, you know, something? No, no one ever talks about that. And you know, we learn about budgeting and HR and those things are important, right? But, but I think influence is a critical skill. I wish everyone had the realization that the choices that I make as an individual are determining the influence that I have with the people around me positively or negatively, right? Influence definitely can be negative. That's the ones, that's the kids you don't want your kids hanging out with, right? There's some very good influencers who use their influence in a negative way. 
So I think character is critical because your character is the determining factor in every choice that you make. Um, and every single interaction that you have with someone is going to come down to those values you have as an individual. That's based on character. And, and character is the foundation for everything that we talk about and speak about. We, we have to teach what it is, though, to most people, because most people definition of character is means you're good or bad. <laughs> and, and so when you start telling people they need to improve their character, they think you think they're a bad person. But we always I like to share and Rhea does too. It's a, a quote from a Dr. Henry Cloud. He, he wrote a book called Integrity. And that's, that's where I got these couple of nuggets from I'm about to share. But in, in there, he defines character as the ability to meet the demands of reality. And that's mm-hmm. when I talk about character, that's what I'm talking about. Whatever it is you want out of your life, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, character is the root cause of you accomplishing that or you not being able to accomplish it. And then he says integrity is the courage to meet the demands of reality. So character is the ability to meet the demands of reality. And then integrity is the courage to meet the demands of reality. So that's, you know, that's kind of how we define it. But I, I teach, especially when I'm talking to upper level leaders, I tell them for us, leadership development equals character development. They're, They're the exact same thing to us because to become a, high impact leader, a servant leader, whichever word you want to use, you've got to develop your character. Same thing for a frontline entry level team member. If you want to have a, a high impact individual, they got to develop their character and they absolutely need some competency. But competency is usually not what's holding people back. It's their character. And if they need more competency and they won't go get it, it's a character issue. It's always a character issue. This episode is sponsored by Add Value to Life Coaching and their Inner Circle Team Coaching. With a new team forming in January, limited seats are available. Apply during the month of December to be a part of this group coaching program. Add value, the number two, life.com. Um, so tell us a little bit about the, your value of gratitude individually and as uh, for your business. Um, I just did a podcast on this today. You know, I think when I, I wrote a, a gratitude journal for women about five years ago, and it was interesting, I started researching the benefits of gra- practicing gratitude and it's it comes down to things like you would expect right you know have helps you have a more positive outlook and you know that's kind of normal but it also there's research that shows it helps you sleep better and it makes you a kinder person and it lowers your blood pressure and all of that thing and you know it's not the it's not the moment of sitting down and writing i'm thankful for something or i'm grateful for you know whatever it is large or small but it's raising that subconscious level of awareness to be conscious and grateful in the moment, in the small moments throughout our day. So the analogy I use is if you've ever bought a, a specific car or maybe a, a specific kind of purse, and then suddenly you go to the mall and everybody's got that same purse or everybody's driving that same car down the highway. And it's not that there are more cars like that than there were yesterday, right? It's just that you're subconsciously more in tune with that. You're more aware of that. You're looking for it. And so that's the gratitude. That's the value, I think, of a gratitude practice is helping you be subconsciously more aware of that throughout the day, right? Not in the five minutes when I'm writing it down, but but consciously. Um, and I think that's critical. I think that's critical from a, a personal level. But think about the power of that applied in relationships. And, you know, every relationship is built on trust. And I'm either building into that trust account with the interactions that I have and <laughs> they Forgetting to practice gratitude in a relationship can certainly deplete that um, emotional bank account really quickly. And relative to our customers, I mean, especially me and my customers, I'm just speaking for me, but I always want to express gratitude to the leaders. I was the guy I was talking to. I mean, he's not a client yet, probably going to be, but I was explaining to him how you know I'm always grateful for leaders who share their team with me. It's a it's a privilege, you know, Rhea and I. Mm-hmm. We always say we're not trying to make a lot of dollars. We're trying to make a lot of difference. And that's, mm. you know, that's, that's one reason we, we have our special offer that we do and how people buy books and we pay all of our expenses to go speak basically. And, uh, but it allows us to walk in the room and tell the people your leaders want to invest in you. So we told your leader, if he'll buy books and give them out to you, we want to invest in you. If your leader values you enough to, to, to want to make that investment, then, then I'm going to spend Rhea's money and come talk to you. <laughs> but, but yeah gratitude is a huge piece and I, and I just mentioned there's a book called gratitude marketing if, if anyone out there listening is interested in how to actually use gratitude to uh 
effectively build relationships and make connections with with your clients I, what's what's his first name michael yeah michael michael's i don't know how you pronounce his name is it, it's like s-c-i-o-r-t-i-n-o-c-r-t-i-n-o or something i don't know how to pronounce it but but it's i've actually spoken with michael he reached out to me a while back and we met him down in louisiana one time we were traveling and had had dinner with him and his wife and i mean it's a great book it's, it's pretty powerful he's he's like just honed in on to the pure value of, of gratitude relative to marketing yourself and your business nice well you mentioned uh the great knight swooped in in his in his camaro um what uh what was your most memorable date you know we just celebrated our 20th uh anniversary last week and we were talking about like what what was the, what's a highlight that stuck out and um, we both re fondly remember a vacation we took um, to Santa Fe. It was like a two week road trip that we, you know, did some mountain biking and, and riding and, and that stands out pretty cool. But I think we both kind of came to the realization that the best memory for us or, or best experience or date is how many, how many pieces of life we get to experience together by speaking and doing what we do together. Right. Our goal was to, you know, not work in separate careers, having separate lives but to really, you know, we got married because we like each other. So let's let's figure out how to make that work so that we can do what we want to do together. And, um, you know, we've had some cool experiences. We've been to the Capitol. We spoke at Yale. You know, we've been to um, San, tour San Quentin prison. You know, we've just got to experience a lot of life. We have a lot of days together. Days. And <laughs> it's amazing how many times in our anniversary we're out speaking and we're like, there's no place we'd rather be. Right. Yeah, and for me, I guess got to be the first real date we had. That's that's, I mean, that's the one I remember the most. When we actually, you know, I didn't know Rhea was in the situation she was in when I met her. All I knew was, you know, it didn't take me long to figure out it was weird. Something was she was lying to me about something I didn't know what. And but but our very first date, I had met her, and it was about two weeks later before we ever. It was two weeks before we got to meet again, and I, I picked her up in a a parking lot in a town my mom lived in about 20 miles from where I live, but it was in between where she lived and I live was the town my mom lived in. So I met her in, in a parking lot and she got out of her car, got in my car and we went for a ride. And then we went out to my mom's house and actually sat out in a swing and, and just talked. That was our first date. And uh, it, it was pretty cool. And what's interesting about that first talk was I asked her, or she said something about she didn't ever want to have kids. And, and, uh, <laughs> I, I was never going to have any more kids. What was crazy, just to be transparent, was I had had the surgery where you can't have any more kids about two weeks before I met Rhea. So I knew already that, that might I might be too much information. It's, it's, hey, you got to be transparent. I'm just a real guy, right? But but it's, it's important because I knew I knew that day, that first date, I knew that I really liked her, and I didn't I didn't want to strain her along. I didn't want to strain me along. So I want to make sure that she knew I didn't want to have any more children in my life and but she kind of opened that door to begin with and said she didn't want to have any children. I was like, well, let me tell you something. <laughs> wow. And, and I, I appreciate obviously congratulations. 20, 20 years is, is, is fantastic. And, and it, it, it saddens me. It, it should be the expectation, right? It should be the norm of, of couples being able to live life together and do life together and, and just enjoy every moment together. And uh, I appreciate what you guys are modeling in your marriage and uh, i hope that my wife and i are, are modeling the same in our marriage and and obviously you know there was some destiny elements in your meeting and 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 mac i'm just so proud of you for for walking alongside ria through um through her recovery and through her her rewriting her story and i love that that you've rewritten your story and and you're using it to to help others and so yeah there's, there's a lot of power in that in that connection that you guys have made yeah and to be a bit more transparent with the audience i love transparency some people are afraid of it but i love <laughs> it. the reason is see Rhea wrote a book called uh straight talk the power of effective communication and we self-published and when i was reading her book and editing for her, the first time i was reading it i got to a line in there and the line said uh transparency is the purest form of telling the truth i was like that's 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 pretty good and then I did what we all do. I was like, is that true? Got to make sure I agree first. So is, is that true? And I said, I, I think it is true, but why is it true? And 
And I come up with my line. You know, she says transparency is the purest form of telling the truth. But I say transparency is telling the truth when you don't have to simply because you want to. And I think that's why transparency is the purest form of telling the truth. Because what I'm about to tell you, you didn't ask and your audience members can ask, but they might not have even thought about it. You're talking about us being married 20 years, but she's my, this is my fourth marriage. That might surprise some people, right? I got it wrong a lot to begin with. And what I, what I figured out was what was wrong with my other three primarily was me. What was wrong with mine and my son's relationship was me. I mean, Pretty much, you know, I write in my book, Defining Influence, every problem I've ever had, whether it was a tiny one or a massive one, I was involved in every single one of them. And so what, <laughs> what I tell people, you know, is they you. know the truth, they know the power of, of what we teach and speak about. Because I, this is my fourth marriage, but I've been married 20 years now. I figured out the problem and I fixed it. You're looking at it. You're talking to it. Well, I appreciate your your transparency and uh, you know, both, both my wife and I uh, came from divorced and, mm-hmm. and everybody, when we, when we started over said, Oh, it'll never work. You guys, you guys are both divorced and divorced people make terrible, terrible spouses. And, and uh, so I appreciate that, that you guys have similar, similar elements in, in your journey. And Noah and I have been together for 30 years now. And so, and that's not because we're any better than you. It's just because we're older than you. So, <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, we so just I, love doing life together. So, that, that is amazing what you guys have done, too. So, congratulations, congratulations. to both of you. <laughs> and touching on what you mentioned about Rhea a while ago about us being together, she's been let down her whole life by, by you know, her family. And I, we speak about this from the stage, even about us being, you know, her, my fourth marriage. I'm her first. She did a little better than I did, I guess. And she, but anyway, what I wanted to say was, I ain't gonna let her down. She's been let down enough. It ain't gonna be me that lets her down. And I mean, I, I got to be getting better all the time. And there's a quote from Michael Josephson that we share all the time. It says, "You don't have to be sick to get better." Hmm. We, we always start out like that because we don't want people to think we're talking down to them. I, I actually ask the people in the audience. I'll say, "How many of you are here today because you want your life to get worse?" <laughs> anybody in here wishes your life would get worse at home or at work raise your hand now nobody ever raises their hand so then then we tell them that quote you don't have to be sick to get better we're going to talk to you like you want to get better nobody raised their hand wants to get worse so we're going to talk to you like you want to get better because we're trying to connect right we don't want to offend someone when we start talking about getting better like there's something wrong with them and what do you say about the athlete yeah i mean when relative to getting better, you think of the number one athlete in any given sport in the world today, and I guarantee you they're out practicing to get better, right? Top of their game, top athlete in the world. Nothing wrong with them. They, they better be out practicing to get better because I guarantee you the number two athlete is out practicing to get better, right? There's nothing wrong with those athletes. But we don't have to be sick to get better. Ah, that's so good. Uh, and and it's amazing to me how much our our physical life – you know, taking care of our body, taking care of is a match to our mental life and improving ourselves. And so these athletic um, examples and metaphors of of getting better and improvement, you know, that personal development applies not just to your physical body, but it's such a great reflection of of your mental state as well. And, and the improvement, you know, applies in both areas. And I think it's spiritual as well. So I think, you know, mind, body and spirit, all three of those are areas where where we can grow and we can improve and when we do it improves how we serve others and how we show up in the world absolutely so how has contribution been a part of your journey contribution yeah you want to speak first no uh, well, I mean, Mac kind of already shared with you, you know, we do what we do to make a difference, right? I mean, we both had very successful careers and we walked away from that. And when, when we did, you know, I, I think I certainly had the impression that you just quit your job and cash in your 401k and you put on your LinkedIn profile speaker and people hire you to speak. I think that's, <laughs> not, that's not how it works. Dang it. We, we haven't met anybody yet that that's how it works. <laughs> 
you know, we we had to make some significant lifestyle choices because we were both very successful, but we had, you know, we sold our cars and downsized and sold our house with our pool and our hot tub and all of the fun things that uh, came with being very successful. But, you know, for us, we discovered that we were, it was more important to us to be significant in the life of someone else, right? We've been successful for ourselves, but really success is about me and significance is about we, right? It's climbing to the top of the mountain and that's success, but significance is going back down and helping somebody else climb. And uh, for me, it is the, really the difference between a career and a calling. And, um, you know, we gave, we get pretty much gave up everything. There were some ramen noodle years <laughs> where we, we had to figure that out because you don't go from, you know, where we were to not having a network, not having, uh, you know, connections. We didn't have any books back then. We weren't out speaking. We weren't making money. We lost $30,000 the first year. Um, that was a lot of lessons learned, but you know, we're happier than we've ever been. <laughs> yeah, we invested a lot in marketing thinking we could pay someone to, to, to make people know us and to get our name out there. And we, we learned from that lesson and uh, we figured out when, when you are nobody, there ain't nobody going to make you somebody except for you. <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> you got, you got to do the work. And, you know, from a contribution standpoint, I mean, that's, we talk about it when we go speak anywhere, we, we tell people, you know, we point to the door or the window and say, look, look out the window at the world. It, it, it needs your help. I mean, it needs, I don't use the word contribution, but that's what I'm talking about. Maybe I should use that word, but you know, I tell them we're here, what we're doing today and talk to you, talking here to talk to you about is, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than your job. It's bigger than this company. It's, it's what's wrong with our world out there. It's a lack of character. Show me something, any, show me anything wrong, bad in the world, and you can trace it back to character. So it is a privilege for us to, to be into an organization and talk about character. So good. So what have, what have mentors meant? Obviously you took on personal growth in 2008 as a, as a personal journey. Um, but what have mentors meant in, in, in helping you develop? Yeah. For me personally, you know, I've mentored myself through the seven habits is Dr. Covey is the most influential mentor I had. I never got to meet, meet him. I never got to speak to him. My son and I were actually scheduled to meet with him uh, just before he had his bicycle accident and he never recovered from that and then passed away. But we were, I just wanted to tell him our, our story because my son hated me from age 15 to 19. And I started, you know, I discovered this type of content, which was the seven habits that I discovered when he was 17. So from 15 to 19, he hated me, but from 17 to 19, I had started working on me. And by 19, my mom had been telling him, Hey, your dad's changing. Dad's changing. You need to give him another chance. I don't know what's happening to him, but he's changing. He's getting better. And by the time he was 19, he did give me another chance. And because I had, I had been working on getting better very intentionally for two years, I was able to rebuild that relationship. And, you know, that's, that was, uh, he was 19 then he's 30 today. So, you know, it's 11 years we've had that relationship and he's read a lot of these books and this it's impacted his life. But Dr. Covey's the number one, mentor and he never knows he mentored me that's you know that's one reason that, that i write books the same reason john michael says he writes books because you'll touch people that you're never going to meet and you know i we've done a lot of training and development with john but john does not know who i am but i've mentored myself through a lot of john's books and so i i think mentorship's extremely valuable i usually have anywhere from five to ten people that i'm, I'm mentoring i mean i talk to people all the time same people, the ones that I pick, I talk to them on a repeated basis for years and years and years. And, and I never charge them anything. I wouldn't think of charging them anything, but I, it's been amazing for those, for me to watch those people grow. I mean, one guy was leading four or five people today. He's the VP of an entire state of Texas in a construction company. So that we've been mentoring him since 2013. So I'll let you talk to the mentorship. Yeah, I would agree with Mac. You know, the interesting thing is these days information is out there and there's no excuse why we can't learn from the best and the brightest minds in the history of the world, right? If you have access to a library or the internet or, you know, podcasts or books or audiobooks, like there's so much information out there that we have to take advantage of. Um, and, you know, it's pretty awesome to, to learn from people who led themselves well and learned to overcome. And, you know, it's uh, Sir Edmund Hillary who says, it's not the mountains that we conquer, but ourselves. 
And we can all learn from the examples of people who've gone before us, good and bad, right? We can learn from negative examples as well. Um, it's what we make of it, right? Like anything, the lack of knowledge is not what holds us back in life. It's the application. The greatest gap in the world is the gap between what we know and what we do. We all know things we should do that we hadn't done. We know things we shouldn't do that we do, right? And and hopefully we can grow and develop ourselves. But yeah, like Max said, I think it. A lot of times people think of mentoring as a relationship with someone, and that's that can be a powerful way. But don't forget that we can just read someone else's story, and that's a form of mentorship as well. And Rhea does a lot of a lot of mentorship with uh, victims of of sexual trafficking in the Atlanta area. When we're home, you were were you on the with them today, or that somebody? Yeah, it was yesterday. I hear I hear it through the walls sometimes, which is <laughs> does it by video, but she also goes up and does it in person. So two or three times a week, she's actually mentoring victims of sexual traffic, trafficking here in Atlanta. You mentioned, you mentioned, um, well, I'm going to turn it around. So goal setting is different than goal achieving. You mentioned the gap between knowing and doing, and, and a lot of us know things and, or, or make statements that we want to do something. Um, we set goals that, you know, I want to do this. I want to have this. Can you, can you speak a little bit into what makes the difference between goal setting and goal achieving? Mm. I think it simply comes down to a decision, right? It's, it, it's the difference between I'm interested in an outcome and I'm committed to doing something about it. And nobody else can make that decision for us. Most of the time we don't achieve what we want just simply because we are, they're not willing to put the work in or we're not willing to make the sacrifice that's required. I mean, beyond a few things that just aren't physically humanly possible, <laughs> we can do just about anything we want to if we are willing to put the work in and continue the journey long enough and make the sacrifices. See, a lot of times we want to reach for, for something, but we won't let go of what's holding us back. My, my Corvette Z06, when I got rid of it, it had claw marks on it when I, when I, <laughs> when I, sold, when I sold my Corvette Z06 and bought a Nissan Sentra by choice. I had plenty of money. I didn't have to do it but I knew where we were going. Go ahead. But I think, you know, it does come down to just absolutely 100% being committed to that outcome. But I think the way that we can achieve that and to make that easier for ourselves is to build that discipline with ourselves. And that comes down to the power of small, right? Transformation doesn't happen in a day. It happens every single day. And when we realize we can break whatever it is that we want to achieve down to, to a very tiny something. I use the analogy that if I want to lose weight, right, I get on the scale and I'm like, oh, I want to lose some weight. So I, I go to the gym and I work out for three hours and I come home and I'm exhausted. And I get back on the scale, I haven't lost any weight yet. And I go to the gym tomorrow and I work out for three hours and I get on the scale and I still haven't lost any weight. See, I might be making progress, but I have to push past the point of no results. And as humans, we get frustrated with that, right? We want to see results immediately. When we want to, to change something, we have to be willing to push that past the point of no results. Like when you take the ice cube out of the, the freezer, it starts to melt, even though you can't see it yet. And so when it comes down to that, the leverage the power of small, break your steps down into something very small so that you can, you know, 100%. This is a goal today. Uh, today, I'm just going to do five minutes of exercise, right? But but consistency will be intensity every single time. Going to the gym for three hours once in a day is not going to really see me any results. But if I make some small changes relative to exercise or, or diet, and I, I'll get to where I want to go, assuming I'm committed to the process, right? It's the process of progress. Let me just say, you know, for people out there who maybe are trying to accomplish something they haven't accomplished yet, first of all, it comes down to our values. Talking about something doesn't mean that we value it. I mean, we have to have behave, align our behavior with, with our thoughts before that's actually a fact. But, you know, I always tell people, you got, there's a simple question. You got, you got two sets of questions you need to ask on the outside of it, and there's a gap in the middle. But who am I and where am I? And who do I want to be and where do I want to be? And those could be, it could be a lot of answers to those questions, but wherever you are and whoever you are compared to where you want to be and who you want to be, is going to be a gap in there. And then there's one question, as long as you can answer both of these questions, there's one question that will always get you there. If you, if you follow through on it and it's, will what I'm about to do move me in the right direction? Mm -hmm. And 
you, it's up to you then. You know, if I go, if I hang up, you know, from, from talking to you guys today and, and I go watch some crazy, goofy TV show, is that going to move me in the right direction? Probably not. Probably not going to. But I can do it, but my, my gap's going to get wider. But if I go read a book or if I go think and reflect on something or I, I do something that's going to actually move me in the right direction, then my gap's going to get, you know, narrower. And so that's that's a simple question that, that I like to ask myself all the time is, will what I'm about to do move me in the right direction? And if you just need to rest, you've been burnt out all day and you want to go turn on some some TV show that not a lot of value in it, but there's value in it let you unwind and, and get away from the world, then there's a lot of value in that show because it really ain't about the show. It's about about you taking time to rest so that it's always relative. Everything is, is relative. It's relative to your values and your mission. Something you may do that may be highly valuable. If I did it, I may think it's not valuable or or vice versa. Either, either way, it depends on who we are and, and where we're going, What what's important. But we need to decide that, not let society decide that for us. I really like that. I mean, obviously, it, that narrows it down pretty clear, right? Here's where you are. Here's where you want to be. Is what you're doing going to take you towards that? <laughs> yeah, and I got another question. You know, when I really get it narrowed down is, what's the most important thing that if I don't do, do this, the rest of it doesn't matter. I don't like a big long list of things to do. All I need to know is what's the, what's the most important thing that I, that I need to do. And I need to be doing that. The rest of it doesn't even matter. <laughs> nice. I can't keep up with a list anyway, but I can keep up with what I need to do next. <laughs> course, I'm right there with you. This person. Yeah, so. Rhea can handle the list. <laughs> yep, got that. <laughs> what inspires you? Go ahead. Uh, to me, I, you know, I think that the people that we touch in, inspire me, um, you know, being able to make a difference in the life of someone else is incredibly rewarding. And, and really the principles that we teach, that's what are, you know, that's what makes a difference. It's not that we are special. It's just that when we share the principles and people apply them, they see results and that inspires me. Um, that drives me because people like you inspire me. People who are trying to make a, the world a better place. I mean, that's what inspires me. That's why I'm so fired up and excited to get out and meet people, introduce myself to people, not not so they can know me, but so they can know the principles that I know. There's nothing special about me. I'm just a regular guy, but the principles we teach are, are very special if you apply them in, in your life. We don't want to tell people how to be. We want them to figure out how to be on their own, but what inspires us are meeting people who actually, they want to get better with the intent of helping other people get better. That, that's what inspires me. Nice. That's so good. All right. So what do you guys love to do in your free time? <laughs> I like doing this. this? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But but if you really want to talk about something besides this, we, we like to we like to travel. We like to go. We were at the beach last week. Rhea loves the beach. So I love to take her to the beach. I like the beach, too. But I really like taking her to the beach because she loves it so much. And we actually just ordered a, a Airstream travel trailer. We've never even been, been in one or had one. Don't know anything <laughs> about it, but. We just ordered one back in June. It's supposed to be here maybe this month or next month. And we're going to try to live the rest of our healthy life about maybe 50 to 75 percent of our time in that thing traveling all over. Because all we have to really do is be near an airport. And as long as we can get to an airport in a couple of hours, we could really be anywhere. So we're probably going to be in Florida a lot, but we're going to be all over the country. But that's I think that's what we like to do. Rio runs. We're going to be in California next week. She's running a marathon out in uh, Big Bear near San Bernardino. And Woo. we actually got two speaking engagements while we we're there. We had we had scheduled for her to run first. And then a, a client who was following us wanted to know when we were going to be back in the area. And I said, <laughs> we're going to be out there in the next month. And they said, like, well, we need to schedule something with you. And we'll pay our expenses to go even if we're not going to be there. But they were nice enough to, to schedule it around while Rhea's running her marathon. So we go going to go out there and do two speaking engagements for the same company and then she's going to go run a marathon and when we're going to stay a couple extra days and go hiking we like to hike so we're going to be at a joshua tree uh what is that a national forest or park or something yeah. so we're tax go. deductible travel i like it it is now it wasn't to begin with <laughs> but as, soon as, as soon as the client wants us to speak now i had to go back and take all of that those their seats and air travel and all that and now it's now it's an expense even the even the airstream is going to be an ex, uh, business expense because there you go hotels. we're going to go out and you know market to people meet with people if we were in colorado we talked to you guys while we we're out there you, know, you guys in colorado right 
That's right. right. Okay. I, I talked to so many people. I Sorry, forget yeah, sometimes. I, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was in Colorado. You guys, we're going to be out there in that airstream for a month or two, some point. So we hopefully we get to meet you guys when we come out that way. That'd be great. Yeah, we got a dinner dinner happening for sure. So thinking on that line, what is the big dream? I mean, maybe you just shared it. Maybe the airstream <laughs> is the big dream. The big dream, I, I can wrap my piece of it up, and the airstream is a huge piece of it. And because I tell people already now that we've started talking about it, we haven't quite been there yet, but ever since I learned about the seven habits, we've been trying to apply those seven habits to our life, and it's working. I mean, there, there's no book that I'll ever read that I don't see the seven habits. Everything in my life, in my mind, it's the seven habits. I can wrap it all around. I can package it right into the seven habits and the eighth habit. Dr. Covey wrote a book called The Eighth Habit uh, as well, which is it's finding your voice and inspiring others to find theirs is actually the habit. But just to put it in a nutshell, I tell people we're trying to right now, we're real close. You were right. We're very close. We want to live a life where you can't tell if we're working, if we're retired, if we're on vacation, because they all three look exactly the same. And we're like this close. I was I was getting my teeth cleaned the other week and the hygienist was asking me some questions and I was just answering the questions and she said, Are you retired? I, I said, No, but I like I like that question. <laughs> I said, All that stuff I'm telling you, that's we're working when we do that. I mean, we love to travel. You got anything to add on that? No, I think that sums it up. You know, we are living the the dream, right? I mean, uh, you know, your life purpose is your one sentence summary of how you change the world. And I think while none of us ever get there, right? I think we are growing towards that. And, you know, we don't know where the journey will take us necessarily, but as long as we're intentional about continuing to grow and, and move purposely towards that, it's a journey. It's not a destination. Um, but I think we get honed in a little bit more and more and more and um, we're right where we can be. Yeah. When we go to the beach, I don't, I don't want to turn off my phone. If you call me, I want to talk to you. I just want to talk to you while I'm walking down the beach instead of sitting on my back porch. <laughs> or, or hiking on a trail someplace. So really, we've really taken those eight habits, eight habits, if you want to call it that, though, to create. You know, it's taken us a while because we're talking about really 2008. We both started reading this type of content in 2008. So we 13 years into this journey. I mean, we gave up all of our income. Both of us went to zero. We sold our house, like Rhea said. We gave up all our toys. And I ain't telling people to do that, but that's what we chose to do. And I chose to do it because of, I'm 52 today, but uh, I, I'm in a hurry. I got to make up for lost time. I got to make stuff happen. And, and a lot of people, they won't give up what they got. They want what they want plus what they got. And a lot of times you can't get that. You got to gotta have one or the other. And I didn't want hanging on to something to be what caused us not to get where we want to go. So we pretty much gave up everything. You got to make space. You got to make space for the new things to arrive. So I really like that. Thank you guys so much for sharing with us. What a what a great conversation. Appreciate you guys a lot and just uh, fantastic. If you enjoy the show, please like, subscribe, and leave a review. We have a free gift for you at add value, the number two, entrepreneurs.com. Our Cyber December deals include one-hour coaching slots for only $97. That's a 75% savings. And we're launching new Inner Circle Team Coaching in 2022. Applications are open in December at addvalue2life.com. In our next episode, Michelle Mraz has re rewritten the story of her past, finding strength in her intelligence and taking full responsibility for her life. She genuinely cares for others and wants to help everyone she touches find the story inside them and help them release it into the world.